Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Primary Sources webinar, History, Geography, and the Ottomans, Using Maps to Understand an Empire. We're delighted to have you join us this evening to learn more about teaching approaches for your history or geography classroom, or to learn more about the Ottomans, a fascinating empire who lasted for more than 600 years. And we're situated right at the crux of two continents. Their geography is part of what helped them to rise, and it's part of what makes them interesting. And it's a wonderful lens with which to explore their history. So tonight, we will be joined by two scholars, the first of whom is Barbara Petson of Middle East Connections. Barbara is a Harvard-educated Ottomanist who has been working in the field of Middle East outreach for over a decade now at the Harvard Center for Middle Eastern Studies Outreach Center at the Middle East Policy Council, and at, right now at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And we're joined by Lauren Taki, a teacher at Marfa Junior Senior High School in Marfa, Texas. Lauren is an ELA teacher who's also taught social studies and geography in her teaching career. And she was a participant in Turkey on the Ottoman Cultures Institute that Primary Source ran in 2013. So thank you all for coming tonight. This webinar is supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities, who have funded our programming on the Ottomans for the last two years. So thank you to them. And we're going to start out tonight with Barbara Petson presenting. Barb, I'll let you say more and take it away. All right. Thank you so much, Deb. Can everybody hear me OK? Um, all right. I am very excited to. Um, uh, join you all this evening and talk about the Ottoman Empire. Um, as many of you who have uh, done some things with me before know, I'm a little bit fixated on the Ottomans. Um, I think they're a very, very interesting um, empire uh, and culture. Um, and I particularly love using uh, maps to talk about the Ottomans, to talk about um, uh, lots of places, actually. And um, the technology of uh, Blackboard does not actually allow me to um, force upon you one of my other great loves, which is Google Earth. So count yourselves lucky. You're getting out of it this time. Um, but um, or, or Assassin's Creed, which I also would have loved to show you Istanbul on. So um, I, I'm, I'm only going to show you, for the most part, flat maps. Um, but I think we can um, come up with some really interesting ways to kind of interrogate these maps as texts. And um, I'm really uh, excited to do that and to, to go through this with you. So um, the other thing is that I'd really like this to be as much of a conversation as we can make it. Um, so if you are, um, if, I, I hope everybody has the hang of using the chat box uh, in, on the left-hand side. And to show us that you know how to use that tactic text box. Um, if everybody, if you've got one burning question about the Ottoman Empire that you've never been able to have answered, go ahead and write that in the text box. And I will try and get to as many of those questions uh, as I can over the next you know, 20 minutes um, and then in the Q&A portion at the end. So if you have a question that you've never been able to get answered about the Ottomans or something about how to teach about the Ottoman Empire or what really brings you to this course, um, please uh, go ahead and type it in there in the chat box. Anyone? All right, while you're thinking of your burning questions, um, let me um, go ahead and show you um, a map that I think is a really interesting um, explication of uh, both Europe and the Ottoman Empire. So here we have this map, and this is from 1570, so uh, quite late into um, the Ottoman Empire. The Ottomans start, of course, around about 1300. and. Um, uh, go until about 1923, depending on how you count. Um, and so this is kind of smack dab in the middle, um, where the Ottomans are still um, near the height of their powers, um, you know, definitely very strong, you know, have a, a very deep foothold into Turkey, uh, into Europe. Um, and that's the point at which this map is produced, Europe as a queen. So. Um, here we go. What do we notice about this map? Can anybody type in anything particular that they notice here? 
things I notice about this, um, look who is the head and the heart of the map of Europe, right? We have Spain and Germany. So we have those uh, lovely Habsburgs, um, you know, commanding the heart and soul of Europe. And Europe, of course, is seen as one um, kind of one thing, um, one unified organism, if you like. So where, where, what do the Ottomans control at this point, at 1570? They're, they've tried to take Vienna, or they're just about to try and take Vienna. Um, they are, um, you know, well into the Balkans, right? Um, but look on this map. Where are the Ottomans on this map? Can anybody see them anywhere? What do we have down in this, in this corner? Um, we have... Scythia and Tartaria and Bulgaria and Lithuania and Macedonia and Greece and Maria and then Morea and then if you look on the next slide, if I enlarge it, there's Constantinople down at the very tiny bottom uh, of Europe's skirt is uh, the capital of the Ottoman Empire and there's no indication on this entire map, of course, that the Ottomans are actually controlling most of this area down here, right? So it's very, very interesting to see the kind of European self-image at this point repudiating the power of the Ottomans. So one of the things that I think is very interesting to talk about, um, and uh, Cynthia, this goes to your question, um, is the relation and perceptions between the Ottoman Empire and Europe um, during the period of the Ottoman Empire. But I also think it's really interesting to look at how, you know, the European self-image um, and the way that Europeans, especially in the latter part of uh, the lifespan of the Ottoman Empire thought about the Ottomans, how that has kind of leaked through and still tends to dominate the way that our textbooks um, talk about the Ottoman Empire. That is, it's usually um, a little bit of an afterthought right down there at the bottom of Europe's skirt. Um, it doesn't tend to be thought of as part of the European system of states. Um, it, it gets left out of all of that. So. I think it's a, this is a great map to use um, to talk about the, the, I, the perceptions um, between these two societies and how they saw one another. Um, so what I want to do over the next few minutes is to look not only at um, the Ottoman Empire itself, but to look at um, how the, the perceptions of, one, of, of both sides are reflected in the maps that they drew. But I also want to look at some maps that are done by contemporary cartographers so that we can look at, um, you know, talking about maps as text and what maps actually tell us about how we still think about the Ottoman Empire and about Europe. So let's look in and see. Uh, our first map. Now, this is the first bit of a map that is actually an interactive one, and we're going to come back to it a little bit later. But I wanted to start with this one, which I think of as the baby picture of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, this is meant to reflect the Ottomans at one year old. Um, and um, here you have just this little tiny thing in the middle of all of this space. And one of the things that I'd love for you to think about as you use maps is um, to look and see what's included and what's blanked out. That is very often map makers will um, only draw in borders and cities and interesting information of the place that they're focusing on and leave everything else blank. And I think that that's a real problem because um, we, we therefore tend to pigeonhole even more those societies and, and empires um, and, and think of them as isolated from influences from everything that's going around on around them. So if you look, for example, at this map and then compare it to a map of Anatolia in 1300, um, you see a very different scene, right? And so here, if you watch the Ottoman Empire expand from this little spot, it doesn't really seem all that impressive because it's expanding into nothingness. So cognitively, simply the way our brains perceive this visual information, 
we don't see the Ottomans as doing anything particularly interesting. They're just expanding like a balloon, and we'll watch that in a little bit if we can, um, or, or I'll let you go and watch it in your browsers. But um, here, on the other hand, you see that the Ottomans grow up in um, a, a place with an enormous amount of competition from other states. Um, so you have a dozen or more states right around them uh, uh, against whom they have to compete, uh, including the remnants of the Mongol Ilkhanate over in eastern Anatolia. Um, and then, of course, uh, to their west, you have Christian um, empires like the Byzantines and a whole variety of, you know, Venice and at the Duchy of Athens and the Bulgarians and et cetera, et cetera. So they're not expanding in a vacuum any more than they end up um, contracting later on in a vacuum. So when we only talk about the rise of the Ottomans or the decline of the Ottomans and we don't look at it in the context of what's around them, I think we really miss uh, the kind of the point of the story, if you will. Um, so here again, uh, here's a map that shows us uh, the expansion of the Ottoman Empire. And here one of the things that, you know, I'd love to talk about is we tend to think about the Ottoman Empire as, you know, at its peak around the middle of the 16th century with Suleiman the Magnificent. Um, and after that, things um, go downhill very, very quickly. Um, but actually, uh, interestingly, the Ottomans do continue to expand after that point up and through the, the 17th century. Um, there are still areas where they're expanding uh, before they begin a territorial retreat from different areas. Interestingly, one of the places that they expand into relatively late is down here along the Red Sea into Yemen and actually along the Persian Gulf and into the Indian Ocean. That is, they're competing with the Portuguese in the Indian Ocean and, in fact, kick the Portuguese out of several of their um, uh, forts uh, in the Indian Ocean region because the Ottomans have a very serious interest in that trade. So when we, the story of the kind of long Ottoman decline is one that we really can problematize by looking at um, this kind of map and seeing how the Ottomans expand um, in different uh, um, time periods and sort of look and see, because one of the other things that's interesting if you look at the dates of expansion is that the Ottomans are constantly have to, having to balance um, expansion and defense on both ends of their empire, east and west. Um, that is, that they have to worry about various European powers, but they also have to worry about the Safavids on the other side. The other thing that I think is really interesting is to look underneath uh, the maps. And one of the great things that the Ottomans have given us to enable us to do this is um, an enormous variety of miniature paintings, um, uh, which are not, of course, miniature um, you know, they're not tiny. These are book-sized paintings as opposed to wall-sized paintings. And I suppose it would be more politically correct of us all to call them book-sized paintings rather than miniature. But there you go. Um, and just to think about it, I mean, if you look at where um, the Ottomans had expanded before the conquest of uh, Constantinople, so um, the blue areas and the orange areas, in this area, the Ottomans actually controlled, and then with their further conquest into Europe, there were more Christians ruled by the Ottomans than there were Muslims ruled by the Ottomans. So it was a Christian empire in the sense of having a majority Christian population. And yet when we think about the Ottomans, we tend to think of it in this very, very religious idiom. So when we think about it then as being a very heterogeneous empire, um, maps can help us to tell that story. And when you use maps, um, a different kind of map, which, is, which are these miniature paintings, which are very, very geographic in ways, um, and we'll look at some of the others, but they also help us to fill in what's happening on the ground level. So we can think of them as ground level maps. Um, of what's happening in a locality as opposed to 30,000 foot maps of what's happening across the region. And here we have, I don't, this is a very famous painting. I don't know how many of you have seen it before, um, but this is a painting of the levy of Christian uh, young people, uh, young boys here, uh, or young men uh, who are being recruited into the Ottoman Janissary Corps. Um, and here are all their families and the priest of the village, etc. cetera. Um, and as you can see, uh, they're counting out the gold. Each family is being paid in recompense for, their, um, for the, the children being drafted. Uh, essentially. And it's, it's also quite interesting. I mean, I, I use this a lot when I'm talking about the role of women because you'll notice that all these Christian women are also veiled. 
um, which is neither here nor there, but I just thought I would point it out because it's interesting to have um, that that sensibility um, from the Ottomans as well as from European paintings at the time. Then we can see something that looks more like a map here. Um, this is a, a drawing or a painting of the Battle of Nicopolis in 1396, so a little bit before the conquest of Constantinople again. And you very often have these kind of very geographic renderings of uh, cities and terrain um, as the Ottomans um, uh, tried to memorialize the various battles that they fought. And here is uh, what's happening here is that the Ottomans have already taken this city. Um, Europeans tried to take it back from them and failed in this siege. So this is the Ottomans being besieged in this town. Um, and it's just very interesting to see the way that the uh, Europeans are being uh, represented in, uh, you know, a very kind of um, naturalistic manner. They're not at all really being demonized here. Um, they're all, you know, some of them are, are lounging around beside the cannons you can see here. Um, they're talking with one another. They all have their torches. These guys look like, they, like they're maybe conducting some espionage um, around the city to see if they can get in another way. It's a very, very interesting um, kind of portrait of the geography um, around this town. And I think it's interesting sometimes to look at what is a map from a rather different perspective and to, to look at it um, in that way. Um, here's another map uh, from a little bit later, 1452. This is the famous Carta Catalana. And uh, what I wanted to point out here is um, if you look over here at Europe, um, and obviously this is a map that's drawn from a European perspective for European purposes. Um, it's in Latin. Um, and you look here and look around the region, and what you notice is that there's very little interesting detail given of the European areas of the map. The interesting details um, are given in other areas. That is, that there's more, there's, of course, the cities are given everywhere. So you can see the relative positioning of cities along rivers and mountain ranges. Here's the Atlas mountain range here. Um, this, this is always very difficult for students to figure out that this is how mountains were drawn rather than having them be drawn as little pointy things next to each other. Um, that's another really interesting thing to use these old maps for, to get people to think about other ways that things are represented. And of course, that here, um, where is the center of gravity for this map? If you look at the top of the map, everything is pointing, you know, feet are pointed north and for us, right? Um, if you look at the southern part of this map, the feet are pointed down. So the center of gravity of this map um, comes right across the center here. What's interesting to me about this map is that you have these very, very large potentates around the region um, in very, you know, in exquisite detail um, in their tents ruling their lands. You have the guy down here on his camel. Um, so you have all of this kind of cultural information uh, embedded in this map, which seems to be, you know, really quite, um, you know, not particularly negative about these Muslim uh, empires. Um, and uh, interestingly, they're wearing this kind of purple color of kingship. So there's kind of a legitimization, um, and uh, it's, it's kind of interesting to see the way that they're drawn uh, on this particular map. Uh, right around the time of the conquest of Constantinople. That's the other thing, is that the Constantinople is about to fall, and you can barely see it here on the map, right? So Constantinople doesn't seem to be a particular focus of this map maker, map maker um, who's not, you know, anywhere near the front lines. So it's kind of interesting to see the emphasis as well. And here, I'm not going to talk very much about Constantinople because Lauren is going to come on and um, uh, do some more um, uh, in-depth exploration of maps of Constantinople and how to Please feel free those. to talk about um, Constantinople but, uh, all you'd like, Barb. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lauren. I, I'll leave that mostly for you, but I reserve to, to the right in. to talk about okay. some of my favorite places, um, <laughs> including restaurants that might have been there Excellent. then and are still there now. Um, but uh, one of the things that's, again, really interesting about Constantinople, of course, is that it's, it has this remarkable geography where the old city is 
surrounded by th on three sides by water, um, where you have, of course, this very narrow strait that connects the Black Sea with the Mediterranean. Um, so it's a choke point for trade coming from the north. Um, it's a natural bridge for trade going from east to west. Um, it's a natural port on the Mediterranean. Um, it can be very well protected, uh, hence the Ottomans um, who tried to besiege the city six times before they took it. So it did not fall to the Turks until the sixth siege of Constantinople. Um, so it's very, very interesting to um, look at the geography of Istanbul and see um, how that fits into um, the sense of the city, for example. Um, and we can talk more about the, the conquest, et cetera, later. Um, again, just wanted to, to show you, on the one hand, this is a city that's very easily defended if you can defend uh, from the water, um, but you're also kind of cut off from, uh, can easily be cut off from resupply. So it's a very interesting kind of strategic um, um, situation geographically. Um, okay, so here's another map. Um, anybody want to jump in with anything that they notice about this map? If you were looking at this map, when would you guess it was from? Any thoughts or guesses on that? How could you tell when this map is from? Not speaking, of course, Latin, which is always a bit of a problem. One of the things that you can look at is if pink here is the Ottoman Empire, it means that the Ottomans have already conquered Egypt and uh, the holy cities. Uh, which means that this is around 15, 15, 15, 20 um, uh, after that point. So it's sometime in the 16th century probably. What's interesting about that, though, is that you have this gentleman here, our sultan, um, is Muhammad, Mehmed II, the conqueror of Istanbul. So even though this is well after his time, um, he is still seen as being the kind of be-all and end-all of what it is to be an Ottoman Turk, um, as though he lives forever in infamy for having uh, conquered the city. Um, and if you notice what's next to him, what's really interesting about this depiction to me is that you have these two purple devils sitting on either side of um, the Ottoman Sultan. So whereas earlier we had some maps that seemed to show a rather neutral depiction of the other side, here we have a map that um, on the one hand shows the great uh, extent of the Ottoman Empire, um, but on the other hand shows um, the kind of threat that they pose to uh, to Europe um, and to surrounding countries as well. So um, it's very interesting to me to look at this map as a kind of text in that um, in that way. Um, any other thoughts or comments on this map? And we'll have some time for questions at the end as well. If anybody wants to jump in. Um, so here um, is another, you know, the, the follow-up of the depiction of um, Mehmed II in the previous map. You know, this idea of the Ottomans as an enormous threat coming into Europe. Um, and, um, you know, many historians, as, as Gibbon said, you know, it would have seemed to anybody in the 16th century that, you know, sooner or later Paris was going to have mosques instead of cathedrals. Um, and here you see another uh, Ottoman miniature. This is the Siege of Belgrade, I believe. Um, and so here you have all of the Ottomans, and the Franks in this one have completely disappeared, right? There, there are no defenders of this town. But what's interesting to me about it is, you know, how carefully the miniature painter has represented the geography of this city. That is, that this is um, certainly a document that's celebrating the conquest of Belgrade. But I think it is also a strategic document so that should the city be retaken, should they be, need to defend the city, others in the palace, um, uh, you know, young, um, relatives of the sultan who might at some point become sultan themselves, uh, members of the Janissary Corps, you know, would have access to these kind of strategic maps of what Belgrade looked like and therefore what its, um, you know, strategic weaknesses, et cetera, might be. And here uh, we have an, another very interesting kind of map. This is by the, the very famous map maker Piri Reis, uh, who was an admiral for the Ottoman Empire and who um, was very interested in mapping um, the whole, uh, the, the European um, Ottoman context 
And in this particular map, you can see that he's, um, he's got two cities on here. So I'm not sure if you can see what's going on here. Here we have um, a sea, and here we have land. So this is how they show the kind of ins and outs of the coastline. Can anybody guess what these cities are? Very interesting. What kind of cities do you think that the, yeah, the mountains are, are um, you know, very interesting, colorful, very unrealistic kind of um, perspective? Sorry, one second. Those are my children in the background um, not uh, uh, hearing me. Um, so the, here what we have are um, the cities of Marseille here in the north and Toulon here in the south. And this is how the Ottomans are um, showing where these cities are. And these are parts of a very large book of maps that's called uh, the, the uh, Book of Sea Maps, perhaps, uh, by Piri Race, which show all the ports around the Mediterranean um, in this kind of very, very um, detailed perspective. And why do you think Piri Race is so interested in the hundreds of ports around the Mediterranean and the Atlantic coast. Well, you know, look what he's showing. He's showing you um, where, you know, here you have all these windmills, you have where the city's walls are, you have what kinds of populations are outside of the walls and where, where the forts are. And very interesting, here you show that there's a chain across the harbor. Um, telling you that it's going to perhaps be a little bit more difficult to get in here. You show by how many ships are coming in and the size of those ships exactly what kind of navy might be at anchor in this particular place, whereas here at Toulon you have a large ship, so it can have a deep harbor, uh, but not so many, so it's a smaller place. So it's very interesting to see, again, strategically um, how Piri Race treats these various cities. So, okay, I'm giving points for the next one so we can get somebody else in here in the chat uh, area. Uh, who can tell me what city this is? Dee 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 dee. I'm going to sing the Jeopardy song if nobody types. I'm telling you, you really don't want that to happen. Can anybody guess what this city is? Another Mediterranean broadly defined city. It might help if you look here. Yeah, please. You don't want Barbara to sing. Um, can, can you tell from here? Very good, Susan. It is, in fact, Venice. So again, look how detailed um, Piri Race is in terms of showing you know, where it's navigable, where it's not, where, um, you know, what kind of boats they have, um, what size boats can fit into this harbor, et cetera, et cetera. What kind of prize can I give over, I would have thought that my not singing was probably a good enough <laughs> prize, uh, but I'm ha the gondolas were in fact a giveaway. And if I could give you a gondola for guessing, Susan, I would do that, but um, uh, I can't quite think of how to do that. Okay, so what I wanted to do here, um, if I can find it on my other um, sheet, nope, wrong one, sorry. I'm trying to find where I cleverly um, put this. So if you would like to, um, I'll post this here in the chat bar. If you'd like to grab this address and put it into your browser, um, you'll be able to see this, um, this uh, GIF expand. So what the, the um, author of this particular map has done is to show you that simply the date and the expansion of the Ottoman Empire. So um, grab that uh, um, address and if you've got a browser window open, just plug it into the browser and it should go ahead and play. Every second it will change dates and you can watch the Ottoman Empire expand and then contract. Can everybody see that? Let me know if, you, if that works for you. And again, what to me is very interesting about this is that you see the Ottomans expanding and contracting in a vacuum. Nobody is really around them. Okay, I'm going to uh, move on. Oops, I'm moving on in the wrong PowerPoint. Um, uh, but I, th I think that's a really interesting way to look at the way that you can manipulate maps with technology. Um, oh, I can if I click the arrow at the right. Oh, you mean on the actual um, thing. I thought you were talking yeah. to me, Deb. Okay. Well, I will if click you put it in your browser right. and then you go click ahead. the arrow at the right side of the screen, it will go to the next phase of Ottoman history. So the empire will expand and contract 
at your command. Such power. <laughs> Such power, <laughs> indeed. Um, but against nothing, so it's kind of interesting. All right, I'm just gonna I'm gonna do a couple of more here, um, and then turn it over to Lauren. Um, this is uh, one of the things that I think is really interesting to look at. Again, when we look at um, the Ottoman Empire in Europe, and when we think about these two um, civilizations, as it were kind of set against each other, which is how they're normally presented in the um, uh, in textbooks, for example. Um, you, what you miss is the enormous variation inside each of those empires. So that, for example, the Ottomans are always um, taught as an Islamic empire. Um, now, this, of course, is a contemporary map. It's not a map of the Ottomans. It's a map of the contemporary Middle East. But I put it up because I wanted to show you just how much religious diversity there is in the areas that the Ottomans controlled. So of course, along the Levant here in the, on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean, um, there are populations, and have always been populations of Jews, although in Ottoman times it was a much smaller population, of course. Um, lots of Christians in uh, Cairo, or in Egypt, and along the Levant. Um, Druze populations, which is an offshoot of Shiism. Um, and then look at East Eastern Anatolia, you have this area where you have an enormous amount of Shia, um, Shia-ish uh, um, traditions, including um, uh, Alevis um, and other uh, offshoots of what we call Alid, that is um, sympathizers with Ali uh, and, and his family. Um, in addition, of course, this is where there are many Kurds, where there were in Ottoman times also many Armenians. Um, so you have this very, very mixed bag religiously of people who are not quote unquote orthodox Sunnis, um, but who were, um, and, and who the Ottomans sometimes distrusted because they thought that the Shia might make common cause with um, the Safavid Empire. Um, but at the same time, the the Sufi orders that were connected to a lot of these groups were also a very important part of um, uh, Ottoman legitimacy. So it's a very mixed story. Um, similarly, if we look at Europe, when we talk about Europe being quote unquote Christian versus the Muslim Ottoman Empire, you know, for, for Christians at this time, I'm not sure how many of them would simply have described themselves as Christian, right? What kind of Christian you were mattered an awful lot. So thinking about the fact that this is the period where you have, of course, the Catholic-Protestant um, wars um, and enormous divisions, not only between these areas where you can see where you had uh, populations of various kinds, but also the fact that you had mixed populations within many countries. So understanding Europe and the Ottoman Empire through the lens of religion, particularly when you talk about an Islamic Ottoman Empire and a Christian Europe, um, I think you erase so much difference um, that it obscures a lot of what was going on. So that, for example, the Ottoman Empire allied itself with France um, against the Habsburgs. Um, the Safavids tried to um, uh, have an alliance with the Habsburgs against the Ottomans. Um, so you have these cross-cutting allegiances that have nothing to do with religion and everything to do with politics, right? So. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it there. I mean, I also put in some maps here just to look at a non-European centric view of what all these empires were doing. And I particularly like this one because it just shows how small the European uh, Austrian Habsburg Empire was relative to what else was going on in the world at that time. It's just kind of an interesting perspective. Um, all right, I'm going to click through these. I talked about Ottoman economics a little bit. And um, so I can give uh, um, your, Lauren, you your time. And I'm sorry, I went a little bit longer than I expected to. So, oh, I wanted, I'm sorry, I wanted to end at one more illustrative map. So we started out at the beginning with the map of Europe as a uh, queen. And I wanted to end with this very famous map of Turkey in Europe as the sick man of Europe. So that, um, you know, this very famous depiction of, um, of the Ottoman Empire, um, you know, with a very, very bad head cold. Um, it's already lost Greece, and it's now about to lose almost all of the Balkans. Um, so again, maps are not just, um, you know, unambiguous depictions of geography, um, but are texts with stories to tell. And I'll leave it there. 
Great. So Lauren, I want to welcome you to the webinar. For those who missed the introduction, Lauren Taki is a teacher in Marfa, Texas, who traveled to Turkey as part of the NEH Ottoman Cultures Institute. And her role in the webinar is to share with you some techniques that you might use to introduce maps in the classroom for teaching history and geography. OK, Lauren, so when you're ready, just click your talk button and take it away. I think I'm ready, Deb. Thank you so much. And welcome, everyone. I appreciate um, your time this evening. Um, I wanted to talk about a couple of different ways to use some of the maps. Um, some of the maps that uh, Barb has shown already have been really incredible. That was one of my last comments. I love that non-Eurocentric map of the gunpowder empires. I thought that one was really neat. Um, but I don't think you're going to be seeing a lot of repetition with these sets. So hopefully it will be something um, new and interesting for you to think about. And I'm hoping to bring up different ways for you to use these maps with your students um, in um, either the geography classroom or the history classroom. Um, and I've also linked it with critical writing um, so that if you are in an English classroom or you want to help those English teachers out there, um, you'll be able to do so with some of the follow-up questions um, about the maps. So the first map set that I've put together, um, the challenge for the students is to lay the maps across their desk in chronological order. Um, this is similar to an exercise that, that the um, scholar teachers did while we were in Istanbul. And it is surprisingly difficult. Um, as a side note, one of the things that I wanted to talk about is setup. I know a lot of schools have a difficult time with uh, lots of colored maps being printed out. And yet, I think that the colors really do help the students a lot. One of the things that I would suggest doing is um, laminating the maps or putting the maps in sheet protectors so that the students are able to handle them and that you'll be able to um, use them in years following. Um, and so hopefully that will decrease that financial strain that might be there at your particular school. Um, this is meant to be um, part of group discovery um, so that the students are able to work together in smaller groups. Uh, so let's look at the first map of putting the maps in chronological order. Um, I do have the dates off to the side so that you all are able to see where they're at. Um, but when you print these out for your students, they won't have access to that. And so as I'm flipping through these, I hope what you're noticing is that they are different perspectives of Istanbul and um, that you're, let's see, that was, yeah, that was the last one. Um, one of the things that we hope that the students would take a look at are the outlines of the city itself and see that it's growing and use that as one of their markers for where it's at in time. Also, how um, densely um, populated or densely built the city might be would also be another clue for them as to when to place the map in order. And I'm just sort of going back and forth amongst these so that you can see those items taking place yourself. Um, another marker that we used um, was uh, technology. And that has a little bit to do with um, one of my later groupings um, and how the things are built and represented. And so the students would work together using um, these different visual clues to um, put the maps in order. And I think that one is just beautiful. And um, hopefully the students would know that uh, it would have to be rather modern for, for, for that particular representation to be in place. Um, and here are some of the discussion uh, questions that so you would either be able to um, talk about with the class as a whole, or to have the students um, write these items down. 
And the first thing would be um, having the students just think about what were the particular visual clues um, that allowed them to put the maps in any chrono what they believe was the correct chronological order and which clue did they rely upon most heavily. Um, a lot of critical thinking involved in um, that. Um, and after you tell them what the correct order of the maps is, um, did their reasoning hold true? Uh, why or why not? Um, and what changes or continuities do you see in that map set? The change in continuity question um, for those of you out there that might teach AP World History is definitely one that's important for the kids. It's one of the three types of essays that they would need to learn how to write. Um, and I think that just using maps alone for the students to be able to respond to that question is actually a really um, neat way for them to, to think about those changes and continuities um, instead of using it as purely um, a historical writing question. The next set, set number two, um, is to review the varying perspectives in the maps. And that was one of the things that I liked a lot about some of the maps that Barb had shown us um, in her segment, where you really were getting uh, a very unique view. The Peary race, where he was paying close attention to the outline of the, of the coastline, uh, but inland, not so much. That wasn't what he was thinking about. Here's another Peary Rays, an 1800 map. Look at the placement of um, Europe and the North Sea. 1572, that one overlapped a little bit on the picture. I'm sorry, I think I had the um, map a little bit too big on that one. I think we saw this one with Barb, 1455. And then finally, um, it feels like we're sort of circling around um, Constantinople or Istanbul, looking at these images in a variety of ways. And the critical writing or discussion questions for this particular grouping is for first the students to um, take on the role of a cartographer and which map do you consider most correct? I know today we do spend time in geography classes showing students different um, map types and perspectives, um, but we're very used to the maps being presented in one particular way. Um, and so I think that it's an interesting uh, mental challenge to look at maps that are presented in different ways and, and to think about which one they consider most correct. And then possibly the question that links even more to um, history is thinking about why that map would have been drawn with that different perspective. Um, first of all, where is the cartographer from? And um, did he have a particular uh, a job like Perry Race where he would have been paying close attention to one thing and maybe not something else. And also, what time period was uh, the map completed and how did that have uh, an impact on what the cartographer drew? Um, some of what Barb brought up earlier fits right in with that. We're at the beginning of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the Ottoman sultans themselves are, are not depicted in a negative way. And yet, what was it, Barb? Maybe about 200 years later, um, little devils show up on, on either side. Let's see. I haven't been paying attention to comments. Did anyone have a question? No? OK. I'll move on to my final map set. Um, and this one would be looking specifically at technology and architecture uh, to determine the chronological order of the maps. Um, one of the things that I really liked looking at when I was looking at these maps was first how the buildings were built and then what boats they were showing out in the harbor. Let's look at this first one. Um, 
obviously sort of a computer generated. Uh, the main thing that we see right in the middle, I think, gives us a clue on what this map is representing and when in time it would be, uh, would have been. This next one, um, the cannon that's at the uh, on the ship at the very bottom, and yet at the same time, it looks like they're rowing with that particular one. The Latine sails. Is that a Latine sail, Barb, or am I am I totally lying? Thank you for totally putting me on the spot about that one, Lauren. Um, I I am not. Not a problem. <laughs> um, it's it's interesting. I am um, I'm really fascinated by people who can tell cars apart, um, and I can't do that. <laughs> so ships is even a little further behind beyond me. Um, but um, I think the Latine sail is actually more. I could be wrong, but more of a triangular sail. Or okay. I might just be thinking of the dows. Um, okay. So these are the multi um, uh, sail um, ships are. Um, you know, more ocean voyage, longer um, thing. Yeah. So again, yes. There you go. That's very good, Mike. I think you're right that there might that might be a Latin sail there. Mm -hmm. um, but the the Latin sail itself is like the triangular one that helps you to pack and be more maneuverable um, with the wind. And that is and all I know about that. Thank you. And the reason that I'm um, tossing you in, Barb, is because I really don't think that anyone um, knowing that I'm from Marfa, Texas, uh, should think that I know a thing about boats. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So yes, using uh, what's happening with the boats, are they using wind power versus people power? Um, and then. Um, Let's see, no boats to look at on this 1432 map, um, but here we're able to see a lot of the architecture um, as part of the elements. Um, and then our critical uh, writing questions or discussion would be um, to explain how you use those two items of interest to place the maps in order. Um, what were some of the things that you noticed changing along the way? I think I brought up people power versus wind power. Um, and what other elements um, were on the map that could have helped you determine chronological order if, um, if those were opened up? to you. Um, and those are the um, three different groupings that I had come up with um, that you would be able to use in both geography as well as uh, history classrooms. If anyone has any questions on those, um, I'd be really happy to pass that off to Barb. <laughs> Nice puzzle, Florin. <laughs> again. Well, we have about 10 minutes, and I wanted to give people a chance to react to the different strategies and groupings that Lauren shared, as well as um, any questions about sort of trying this in the classroom and what might likely happen or what has happened to you when you've taught with maps that may resemble these in some ways. So questions about the teaching strategies for Lauren and about the pieces that Barbara presented in terms of understanding the greater scope and you know, interests of the empire are welcome now in the next 10 minutes. Feel free to raise your hand by clicking on the small hand in the square box in the participant section it's in the left column. And you can speak aloud your question or just type it into the chat box and share it that way. Either one is equally effective. OK, so Cynthia says she's interested in trying maps to help visualize history. Will these maps be available for you to use? Yes, sure. I mean, what I can do is create a Dropbox file for anyone who is interested and email it out with you. Um, you should send me your email address and just express interest in receiving that, because I don't want to send a huge Dropbox link to people who don't want it. You can also watch the webinar. You'll have that link automatically. But if you want them in this nice static form, which might be easier to handle, feel free to email deb at primarysource.org and just request the, the Dropbox file. Um, the 
The other thing that I uh, would say about that is that um, all of these maps, of course, we've compressed to put them into the PowerPoint. And these are all maps that are um, you know, easily findable and available online, um, either through um, you know, the, the map library at um, the Perry Castaneda Map Library at the University of Texas, um, or through um, Wikimedia Commons, which is where most of the maps that I've used are from. Um, and you can get much better resolution of these maps, um, uh, usually on Wikimedia. Um, and I think that's really important because one of the things that it's very difficult to showcase in a webinar are those fine details of the maps to be able to so that you can really go in and look at things. So one of the things that I really love to do with maps um, is to use them in a, a way that's about storytelling, for example. So um, for example, you could look back at um, one of the maps that Lauren was showcasing. Where were the rowers? I felt sorry for. Here we go. So you have all of these galley rowers in here, and you could talk about, you know, have them um, try and figure out who were these different, you know, what, what's the different technology of these uh, ships. Um, you could um, think about these fishermen in their boat over here. Um, you could have, um, you know, talk about who rows the galleys in the Mediterranean in the 17th century. And this is all, you know, slave labor um, for the most part. And so you could talk about how both Christians and Muslims were enslaved often back and forth many times. Um, sometimes you had Christians who were enslaved and who worked their way up to being pirate captains and converted to Islam. Um, you, I mean, it's very, very interesting. And just looking at some of these, you know, some of the pictures of galleys, and there are many, many other um, representations of these um, ships. And you could do a, a, a whole thing on, um, you know, sailing or shipbuilding, et cetera, in the Mediterranean, and think about what the life of um, a privateer or a pirate or a, um, a Barbary pirate um, might have been like on those boats. Um, that's a really interesting thing. I should point out as well um, that I have um, we've done a, a huge project on uh, the Mediterranean, and it is called uh, Mediterranean Shared Past. Um, dot org. Um, it's our shared past in the Mediterranean, um, and one of the I did the unit on uh, 1400 to 1800 or so. And part of what I looked at was slavery compare in a comparative context in the Mediterranean. But there's also an, an interesting and relevant um, piece on Salonika, which um, uh, it is now Thessaloniki in Greece. And this is the city that was populated very largely by Jews who were escaping um, the expulsion edict in Spain in 1492, um, and who and many also who came from Portugal, having fled to Portugal from Spain. And then when the Portuguese kicked them out, they went to Salonika. So um, there, I've used a lot of maps in that so that you can sort of see how the city was composed of different kinds of people. So it's a great way to sort of use maps to tell those stories. And um, you know, it's, I, I think that's really interesting. But um, you know, as Lauren was saying, another of these stories is you know, look how um, um, populous the city was at, at different times or where the focus of the map maker was. You know, can you guess the politics of the map maker? Um, and we didn't even talk about Para over here, which is the kind of European section of the city. And looking at, you know, a lot of the maps from the 18th and 19th century really focus on Para more than they focus on the old city, because this was where the rich European merchants were. So if you were coming in as a merchant, um, that would be the, the part of the city that you would be um, very much interested in, um, since you know you were unlikely ever to get into the palace over here, and you might have to go and deal with the bureaucrats down the hill in the Sublime Port. So kind of an interesting um, you know, way to think about the political geography of a city. Um, and very rarely, I think, do we look at cities as opposed to empires. Um, but they can tell all kinds of different stories. So I really loved the way that Lauren pulled in you know, these different groupings and, and different ways of looking at the maps. But um, as uh, was it Mike um, said, you know, there, Ed, um, there are a lot of different ways to use these maps. So I'm, I'm interested, um, Ed, when you say that you, would, you want to use the maps, but not necessarily in this way, do you have ideas already of ways that you think you might be using these maps? 
or if anybody else has thoughts on, you know, what you think you could do. I mean, I think with some, with middle school students or with um, younger high school students, for example, you know, just having them go through some of these maps to um, simply identify what the different features are um, would be an, an interesting thing to do or have them trace a map. So here from uh, 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 Istanbul in the, the Islamic era and then you know, where did it go? Here is Istanbul in the Byzantine era. You know, what elements are still there? Um, and there are other ones, uh, some of the other Byzantine maps. Um, you know, you can actually point out, you know, here are the remnants of, you know, here's the, the um, what's the word for that thing, Egyptian thing, obelisk. Um, here's the obelisk, and here's the twined column. And here, if you look on the uh, Islamic era map, you see all those columns that were in the middle of the Hippodrome, and they're still there in that line. So it's kind of interesting to, to be able to pick up features from one map to the next. Barbara, one thing that I noticed on the map that you were showing that had para and the boats on it is that it was labeled Constantinople, not Istanbul, although it was dated 1615. And so I think sometimes the terminology of the maps can be confusing since the Ottomans, after conquering the city, still use the old term and the map maker may have never switched. Can you comment on that a little bit? Oh, that's a great question, and, and um, if I had thought about it ahead of time, I would have cued the music. Um, it's uh, Istanbul, not Constantinople. Um, in fact, of course, up until the very end of the empire, I have 19th century coins um, that are struck in Constantinia, um, which is what the Turks called it, um, the Ottomans called it, right up to the end of the empire. Its official name was Constantinople um, in, in official um, uh, language as much as it was Istanbul. So the two names were really uh, interchangeable in a lot of circumstances. Um, you know, nobody even really knows um, what it, where Istanbul comes from, whether it's, you know, um, people like to think of it as Islambolis, the city of Islam, um, but we have no um, proof that that's actually what, what it comes from. Um, so these, these two names, um, are both very old names and used interchangeably. Um, no European, you know, used Istanbul as the name for the city until, you know, very, very late indeed. And um, in a lot of official correspondence, neither did the Ottomans. And I think partly that's because when you called it Constantinople as an Ottoman, you're kind of rubbing people's nose in it <laughs> um, that you now are the one who rules Constantine's city. Um, if you see what I mean, so you're claiming that history, whereas if you used a new, um, uh, the new Istanbul form, then you're, um, you know, you're making it a much more kind of local term. So that's, that's one thing. I mean, there are some politics in it, but the politics are on both sides. Barbara, it looks like there's one more question, and then I'm going to quickly wrap up because we are just about out of time, but do you want to address the question about the underlying purposes of map making in the Euro European early modern era about conquest and wealth accumulation um, with curiosity and okay, science totally more not. minor. Is this Susan. Ah, Susan. Okay. Yes, sorry, I missed that when it came up. Um, so, um, oh, that's really interesting. Yes, I mean, I think that um, in for the Ottomans, um, there is very often, um, and they're, they're often using these portalon maps, right? So there's often very clearly a kind of navigational purpose to them. Um, but even when they're for a, um, navigation, that navigation could have purposes of trade and purposes of, um, you know, military, uh, you know, attack and defense. And I think both of those are true. And then they're also artistic. I mean, you look at Piri Reyes's maps, and um, I wonder how far back I have to go to find Piri Race. Uh, oh, here, we can use this as stumble map. Um, I mean, these are not maps that are simply made to show, um, you know, where you can get a ship in and how many ships they might be hiding somewhere or, you know, what the trading population pop, uh, possibilities are because of the population, et cetera. Um, these are also maps that are done with um, a very clear artistic sensibility. 
Um, and so I think, and they're often made, the ones that we have, we have them because they weren't maps that were used at sea. Um, they were maps that were presented to the Sublime Port, the Sultan, um, as gifts. And so you would often make a kind of court copy of the map, and then you would make a utilitarian copy of the map and send that out to be copied in the bazaar to sell to captains and, and to give to admirals and, and captains of ships in the Navy so that everybody would have access to these to the information. So I think that there, there are multiple utilitarian purposes um, for making these maps, but there's also, and part of that was also, I mean, Peary Race, of course, also makes a map of what the Europeans had discovered in the New World. So there's also curiosity. There's also exploration. I mean, the Ottomans went to the Indian Ocean and, and came back with maps of, you know, the area around the Strait of Hormuz and up to Basra, um, et cetera. So they were very interested in, you know, once they realized they had to go there and to stand up to the Portuguese, they were interested in exploring that area as well. Great. Thank you, Barbara. And thank you, Lauren, for articulating um, such interesting possibilities in sets of maps. And thank you for collating this collection to share with us because they're so rich, you know, as resources. They are art, they are history, they are geography, they are politics, economics, and so much more rolled into these objects that students can have placed in front of them and be set out on as an exploration of their own. So thank you both for joining us tonight. I want to share with you before we go a few more Ottoman resources. We have a teacher toolkit at Primary Source on the Ottomans that includes books, children's books, websites and curriculum, as well as film and video resources. So I encourage you to explore our teacher toolkit. And also, if you wish to watch the other webinar in this series, which was called Teaching Ottoman Art, Why and How, it was also with Barbara Petson and a teacher named Deb Rosenbaum from Colorado. So it's available at YouTube at the link right here. And for those of you who are new to us, um, Primary Source is an organization that works on all the different world regions supporting teachers in teaching about the world through courses online and face-to-face, -face, resources, and study travel experiences to get you ready to bring the world to your students. So we welcome you to stay in touch with us and to contact us about how we can help you and maybe even someday to travel with us and create a map of our own. So thank you all and uh, good night. And please feel free to be in touch via email and our website after the webinar. One last big thanks and shout out to Lauren and Barbara. What a wonderful job. Thanks and good night.